how do startups identify and refine their products? Get that feedback from the market. Of AI, is a, it's just a different topic on its own, right? Some of the core processes we use, so we... And training is kind of an ongoing process as well, right? I think whether it comes to whether it's the vision, the time... That's great. Yeah. Ecom Squeezed Podcast. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, great to be here and, uh, yeah, answer many questions that I'm sure you have today. Great. James, to kick uh, things off, uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, your journey and what um, you know, led, you, led you to made this business to create this business sales for startup? So I started my career in sales, uh, mainly mm -hmm. B2B sales. I started in uh, selling to small and medium enterprises or SME as most people know it as. Yeah. And I kind of worked my way up to selling to enterprise software and services. And then the last startup I worked for was kind of high growth startup that was luckily acquired and just over seven years ago, almost eight now. And I decided at that point to help other tech startups grow and that many people had great ideas and a big vision, but they didn't really know how to commercialize that business, how to grow it from sort of five customers to 50 customers. So they do yeah. quite well in getting off the ground, you know, maybe personal introductions, maybe, you know, investor introductions. Um, but how do you actually scale a business? How do you create a kind of commercial or sales engine? grow the yeah, business yeah. and that's that's why I started the business and I realized that this was quite a big market and uh, we had quite a lot of success as well so I, I kept going and hence kind of grown the business from that early point of just me um, to obviously having people and a team in the business. Yeah you're right about you know the the, the founders doesn't have that knowledge of sales side yeah and uh, my next question you know at what stage uh, founders should start considering the transition from a you know, from a founder led business to a team working as a team so at what stage uh, should they think about that yeah it's a really good question i think there's no sort of generic rule as to when to start being i think as early mm -hmm. as possible um but i think you know after you probably sign your first sort of five to ten customers you really need to think about that transition um because it's not a sort of immediate process it's kind of a gradual change yeah, where you yeah. start looking at the process you start looking at you know, areas that people can come in and help grow your business so mm -hmm. that's really important as a, as a i always like to give a straight answer as well as a, a fluffy answer and that the yeah, straight yeah. answer i would say is if you're selling to kind of mid-market or enterprise customers about five customers is a good point to start thinking about how do we right. transition from founder-led to a team-led sales operation. Is, is that same for a product-based and service-based business? Is that, just, is that the same or will it that be a different scenario? Yeah, I, th I think it would be different. Obviously, our focus is on software and technology companies. Mm -hmm. and we don't work with kind of IT services or consulting companies. Yeah. So, yeah, just to caveat my, my advice and my answers, it, it's very much focused Sorry. on software. And typically those software companies will have deal values of 20, 30,000 or more per year. So mm -hmm. we are looking at something that, you know, is not 99 euros a month. You know, it's, you know, thousands a month, you know, in that sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, from your experience, uh, you know, what are the main uh, pitfalls that prevent startups from advancing to the next level? Like yeah, I think there's a couple. Um, one of the major things is that they don't really define the use case of their product and the right. audience that they want to sell to. Normally, those first sort of five customers is a bit of a blend of different types of customers. So sort of chipping away the edges and making a refined use case a refined audience or fine profile is very important so you might find founders sort of servicing lots of different markets lots of different types of clients lots of different geographies and that can be quite complex as well because it's quite hard to build scale there second one is that a founder is often overworked mm -hmm. and they think when Always. they bring in a team uh, that will mean all my sort of problems you know fade away Unfortunately, what you've been doing is through like necessity, through intuition, sometimes even a sense of desperation that means that you do things that are above and beyond. You also know the product and its value and, and often the clients that you're selling to pretty well. So mm. 
you've got a lot of kind of what I call like ingrained intelligence. That there's, there's a sort of intelligence bias almost that you have within you. Maybe it's quite hard to calculate when bringing in other team members who don't come, you know, from building the products from day one up to, you know, day 700. They don't have that prior experience. So you know, thinking that other people will achieve the same results as you in is probably, especially in the first sort of three to six months, is quite mm-hmm. wide of the mark. Yeah. So I would say your expectations as a founder of the success of those hires, especially in the first three or six months, certainly probably if your expectations are there, you probably need to bring them back down to here. Yeah. Um, because you, you've, you've got a lot invested in the business. You're probably still the major equity holder in the business. Mm. You want to make it a success. It's your livelihood. It's kind of, of everything for you. Yeah. Whereas for that new hire, it's not everything for them, unfortunately. You know, there, there are other options for them. They can mm-hmm. go and get another job. Whereas for you to, to fold the business and go to another business is a much bigger disruption and move for you, especially after you might have spent the last two, three years, four years building it. Um, it's going to be very difficult for you to just, you know, move away and go off and do something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned about the product use case and about the, the right audience, right? Is that a part of your service that you provide? Yeah, certainly. I think when a lot of people think about, you know, how to build a predictable sort of sales engine, you think of value proposition, which is very important. And that's often what is done quite early on by the founders, maybe a sort of fractional marketing consultant. That's great to get off the ground. And often you see that sort of on the website, right? But that's typically what I would call sort of having a market niche rather than what I would call like an offer niche. I think there's a big distinction between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, so an offer niche is where you've understood the client profile, their needs, their pains, you've come up with a solution. And more importantly, you've come up with a compelling offer that converts for that particular audience. So that's what I call like an offer niche. And that will include like your unique differentiators as well. Mm -hmm. That would include like, you know, extra sort of bonuses or value adds that you would add on to that offer. It's almost becomes irresistible to that audience. That's what I talk about, like uh, an offer niche as well, um, which is really, really important. So I think a lot of people sort of focus on it as like marketing value prop rather than like, how do I create an offer that converts in the marketplace? And for of me, course, that's, yeah. that's what I mean by um, sort of having an offer niche. And that's definitely step one of our sort of revenue framework that we walk through and scale to be tech companies with. Oh, great, great. Thank you. Uh, you know, how do startup uh, identify and refine their products, you know, their use cases, they have to refine it, um, as you just mentioned, how can they uh, refine it further? Is that you know, based on the, the timeline, you know, you refine it as you go, or do you have a set of plans initially? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think, so obviously, refining um, what I call the sort of market led approach is quite important. So you mm-hmm. want to get that feedback from the market. Of course, um, using like just really inexpensive smart tools like call recording and things like that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, having a um, kind of a customer service application um, that enables you to sort of have those uh, support chats as well and be able to download those chats is very important. And now with the power of AI and sort of machine learning and LLM. You know, there's yeah. there's real opportunities to take a lot of that sort of raw data and be able to query that data very, very quickly. You can spot the common trends, spot even the common messages. You can interrogate transcripts, you know, the last 50 support requests and say, you know, what, you know, does how many times does this phrase come up within these last 50 calls? And you can do that not only yeah. within applications but often you know if you're using something like claude.ai then you know you, you can use that as well yeah ai is a it's just a different topic on its own right so <laughs> i assume that you say a lot of ai right in, in your day-to-day business i assume to, to, yeah, to refine yeah yeah we're okay, refining great. like the offer uh, looking at some of the processes as well and i think we use it a lot for as well as building business cases as well 
Um, mm -hmm. So a typical sort of enterprise action and sort of 50,000 or more per year will probably be somewhere between sort of five to nine calls at a minimum, you know, with the stakeholders. That doesn't include the internal calls. So maybe 50 to 20 calls at least, you know, That's a lot um, of data. Yeah. yeah, in order to close the deal. So you've got all those internal and external um, data points. You mm -hmm, kind of want mm -hmm. to draw a lot of those together and you want to calculate the ROI to the, you know, to the prospect um, to build a business case because ultimately it's about making things easy for that enterprise buyer and you can present the information mm -hmm. that's true and accurate, but also in a smart, easy to understand and digest form that you're going to be, you know, moved up the pecking order. You're going to maybe move aside other projects that they don't deem as a priority as yours. And so often you have shorter sell cycles and high deal values as a result. No, yeah, great, great. Thank you. And, you know, you you mentioned about the refining, the AI, but in order to execute all those, we need the right talent, right? So do you yeah. have anything, you know, you know, that you follow to get the right people on the right seat? Uh, very much. Yeah, I think even prior to talent, so like target market will be first. I think secondly, it's about embedding the right processes. And then mm -hmm. I think firms like assemble the team. You can look up yep. on our website, we have something called the Teams, T-E-A-M's, um, mm -hmm. Revenue Growth Framework, which shows you like how you build a B2B tech company in a smart sequence. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the third step would be like assembling the team. And a lot of that's to do with you know, some of the core processes we use. So we have uh, what we call a role scorecard. So yeah. we have something that defines why is the role here? What are we looking to achieve? What are the goals of this individual attributes of this person? What type of experience or special skills may they need? And then once we've defined that, then we can obviously write a job advert. And then you have like a selection process. And then obviously off the back of that, you would also have a you know, compensation as well, sort of individual um, compensation plan. And then obviously you'd have an onboarding plan as well uh, with that. So yeah, uh, and even in that selection process, there are a couple of, you know, smart tools and practices we use as well to create diversity and equality, but also to, um, you know, create a fair and also excellent selection process because it is yeah, often yeah. to do the selection. Then once you've got the talent, it's about how you nurture that talent and grow that talent. Yeah, great. Thank you. So there are a lot of factors involved in, in yeah. you know, training them and onboarding training and training is kind of an ongoing process as well, right? So you mentioned about this scorecard also uh, to make yeah. sure they are following, you know, their task or executing their task correctly. Um, yeah, it comes before that, actually. The card is not just um, as many people would see it as like a sort of performance review that have sort of uh, documents um, that support that type of like performance review. But, um, you know, there's the scorecard is almost like, why does the role exist? And what are we right. looking to achieve so is that, by uh, this type of role? Is that, uh, you know, on an expert area or is that uh, as a team or is that individual staff that you have scorecard on? Individual staff, yeah. Okay. And then those scorecards would link to kind of your all chart, which will show you, you know, who's Great. accountable yeah. got for it, certain got it. Oh, That's business, a very good yeah. structure that you have. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And uh, in, in, if you want to, you know, the founder, they have to transit, you know, when you initially start, they'll be like, most likely doesn't have that much experience working as a team, right? So when they move transit from that founder to a team, what are the things, um, you know, they have to keep in mind? you know, from your experience um, or pitfalls that they normally see? Yeah, I think on a day-to-day -day level, obviously there are lots of strategic elements written in books, but from a sort of action uh, view, I would say just be in mind or be aware, sorry, that you probably will have to repeat the same thing three or four times and that right. will frustrate you as a founder. Um, yeah. because you're used to sort of seeing things once or twice and then just like going and action it because it's often you. Uh, I think whether it comes to whether it's the vision, the direction, the goals, the, the key initiatives, the key tasks, I think minimum sort of three times. Like obviously if it goes beyond that, then maybe you have performance, but I think initially in that first like three, six months, you will have to kind of remind your team to do certain things so that they start to understand what's important and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, and they also get to know you, obviously, as a founder and, and 
everyone yeah. has sort of two or three things that are really important to them typically. Yeah. So yeah, I think sort of repeating that vision, repeating those goals and key initiatives, that's important. I think the other thing is realizing your own um, kind of operational flow. Mm -hmm. So if you look at your decision-making process, you'll realize that there are quite a few bottlenecks in that decision-making process. And often it will come back to you for a decision. And in some areas you're not so comfortable on, you will probably then defer input from other people in order to then try and make a decision on the thing you've been consulted on. So I think be really aware of that and that will slow down a lot of progress. And that's where you need to think about the, the RACI, R-A-C-I sort of um, way of working, which is to look at like who's responsible, you know, who's yep, accountable, yep. who's consulted, you know, who's uh, influencing its actions. I think, yeah, have a real deep think about that as well. Like, and that's where sort of giving that not just only responsibility, but accountability to that new hire is very important as well. Mm, and that mm-hmm. means that they can actually, to an extent, you know, rule you or you know sometimes not even like consult you because if it's yeah. accountable to their result yeah and especially if it's a uh, you know medium level or low level of priority or importance then you know, sometimes you just got to let people crack on and and do the work rather than trying to meddle in everything and yeah that's um, a good <laughs> that's yeah. true that's true you know, I, I like your point that when you mentioned like you know it can slow down the process and you know keep on reminding them you know uh, as a founder, normally you are quite attached to the product emotionally, right? And you try yeah. to micromanage each of the process. So it's good that, you know, when you said you have to remind them and if they try to meddle with uh, the full process, it can just slow things down, right? That's a great yeah, point. Though. Sure, then, Thank you. There's a good book as well written by Halibich, it's called mm-hmm. Clockwork. And it really like describes that like bottleneck, you know, within a plan process. It's quite quite an interesting read for founders trying to move from founder led to team led because you start to realize when you sort of play it through in your mind and yeah. that maybe you look in your teams or your slack channel you realize they're like whoa actually i am quite a big bottleneck to yeah. progress here and i can't be consulted on everything i can't exactly. be accountable for everything really sometimes i'm just not the best person to you know consult or even give feedback on i know when you're a small team it makes sense to get everyone's feedback but in in some situations that's like what you hired the person to do is to be an expert and gradually improve that function or that area right yeah that's great you mentioned about the book uh, clockwork right do you suggest any other book uh, for example you know for, for the founders who are looking into funding side or the sales side, is there any other book that you suggest uh, you know, for them to read? Yeah, the, the, there are quite a few books uh, that I'd recommend. Uh, the People one, I like a uh, book called Alliance, uh, which is uh, written by, I think it's Reid Hoffman, uh, the founder, I think, of LinkedIn. Uh, same like really your name? A pun? You know, a part of your name, right? Reed Reed, Hoffman. Yeah, Reed, Reed, yeah, exactly. Uh, also, there are lots of books although a lot of the books are written from a sales manager's point of view mm-hmm. like the sales acceleration formula they're, they're great books but they're pretty technical for a founder going into team-led operations you know talk you know like it's okay for someone that's been in the field five ten years doing that every day in day out but they're they're a bit of an overkill i would say for yeah um, you know most founders so yeah on sales i'm I'm not one to say, like, read all these books. I think Mm -hmm. the other thing that I quite like is um, Traction by Gina Whitman from the Enterprise Operating System or the Entrepreneur Operating System. So EOS is quite a good one in terms of, like, that accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, the other one that I like, um, Ology as well, that's a a great book Mm -hmm. for looking at systems. The the Traction is that... um... It's uh, the theme is about the military, right? The Iraq is that the one, uh, right? Yeah, I think it, it comes to originally sort of yeah, that from point. The Gina side, Wickman yeah. is is the author. Yeah, he he writes about you know having these quarterly plans, having these big rocks. Um, mm, yeah, yeah, you know, these kind of big projects that you're looking for, and then sort of smaller projects come from that. And so you can see like the company's rocks, you can see the visual rocks, you can see the individuals' rocks. Yeah, so I think a good a good way of breaking things down it's like a kind of okr um 
um, Measure What Matters by John Burr as well. It's another mm-hmm. good book, another framework. There. But you're not, you're not definitely. Um, there's enough books to, to read for the of next course, yeah. sort of fifty thousand years. So <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't get but, too. Uh, um, I would say, you know, for the basic junkie. one, if they know some kind of knowledge, you know, then yeah. it will it will be easy for you as a business to, you know, communicate with them. So they have some kind of basic knowledge, right? Yeah. In that case, it will be, you know, it's a very hard thing to go through each one of it because they have to focus on the other side of the business to develop mm. the, the product side. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Regarding, you know, the sales process, normally we look into, uh, you know, the impressions um, and the clicks and stuff like that um, on a normal funnel. Okay, B2C. Yeah, from your side, uh, how does it look like uh, when you look into the sales side, the funnel yeah, side? So, so typically, your sales process, you know, the early stage will be sort of five to six stages. Mm-hmm. It'll be right from sort of that initial lead response you know, into yeah. qualifying and then, you know, creating sort of solution to then a proposal to then sort of negotiation flows. Um, in terms of metrics, it could vary from company to company, but you definitely want to be looking at you know, lag metrics, kind of result metrics is another word for that, which is things like, um, you know, average deal value, uh, sales cycle, you know, looking at sort of certain areas, sales stage conversion as well. So, you know, from lead yeah. to sale or from proposal to sale, looking at some of those um, things. And then obviously you've got like pipeline value and volume is quite important as well. So you can keep tracking as to how many deals are in certain stages, what's the value of those stages. But yeah, I, I think there are quite a few metrics. I think, you know, you, you do want to look at leading metrics as well. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, what I would call sort of activity metrics, things like, uh, you know, number of calls per customer, number of you know, has business case been created and, and shared and yeah, things like this, which, are, yeah. which is basically under your control. And, um, you know, whereas like focusing on sort of deal value or focusing on close one revenue to really help you actually close <laughs> more revenue, that age old thing of like, you know, a salesperson given a target, but the target doesn't really help them. It, it tells them to go north, but that's all it does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, you know, you, you, you don't know if you're going northeast or or northwest. So you, you could end up in sort of Alaska or, you know, you, you could end up in, you know, somewhere completely different. You could be in um, sort of Russia. Yeah. So you, you could be in completely different um, areas of the world. But yeah, I think that's quite important as well. Like, yeah, yeah. Think about well, what things you can control and what things you could track at least on a weekly or monthly basis, whether that's, you know, number of outreaches, number of message sent. You know, so some things that ultimately, by looking at that area, you could do an action in the next kind of, you know, 24, mm-hmm. 48 hours to change it. If you can't do that, then you should probably look at those metrics again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the sale process, do you use uh, AI on that side or any other, you know, like uh, communication like uh, WhatsApp or any other uh, messaging platform? Do you integrate uh, those platforms uh, to that uh, sales process? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so um, use AI from the point of across the piece where it's like the messaging and the outreach to mm-hmm. having some of the call cool recordings, call cool transcripts, the processing of transcripts to... Mm-hmm. And writing out some communications as well. Uh, you know, I think most platforms and technologies have integrated AI into their of course, yeah. system now. So, so do you yeah. normally use um, uh, like a chat GPT, custom GPT, or do you have uh, a, a specific platform that you use internally? Uh, so, yeah, well, we we do use chat GPT and, and we use like the avatar function and, and things like mm-hmm. that, but we use other platforms as well, like I mentioned Claude, use yeah, AI good, yeah. within things like Fireflies, which is our preferred like recording platform. Um, yeah, we the might Fireflies use... is that um, the note taking platform. Yeah, right? note taking. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it has some sort of quite smart AI elements, and the transcripts mm-hmm. are very good. Well, uh, we use AI in sort of some of the outreach messaging, whether it be Smart Lead or Clay or something like that as well for some of the outreach. So yeah, I think like 
you know, again, it's the biggest thing about AI is like actually define the use case and exactly, then yeah, yeah. the use case rather than of saying it could do everything. It's really about okay, what what area of the process do we need to optimize? What sort of things are out there that can help us with this? Is that you know something that is already that we have? Is that something that's new? Is that something we need to build? You know, yeah. what would be the cost, the build versus buy question as well. But yeah, a lot, a lot of the tools are, are very good now. I don't think yeah. it's often about stitching the tools together, which is the challenge. Exactly. From yeah, the data find, and responsiveness yeah. as well. Like, yeah, you know, everyone's talking about AI, but not many people are talking about sort of RPA and you know process automation. So actually yeah, connecting yeah. these various technologies together, and then uh, so you can create a kind of seamless workflow like that. It's almost like that that question or, or observation has been delayed to another day. Yeah, Everyone's yeah. thinking about like how can I generate sort of a prompt in ChatGPT, but that doesn't mean that it actually does anything for you. It just sort of sits there as ideation or on new ideas. But yeah, true yeah. value is obviously when you connect it all together. Great, 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 great. Regarding you know, have you worked with any any founders that are mainly AI based? Business? Yes. Uh, do you have? I think there are a lot of business popping up. AI themed. Uh, how, what do you see from your side? I think it comes back to that point around the use case as well. Use case, I yeah. Think, yeah, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, will will now become experts in AI and be part of sort of their path. But it's really about how can you identify the use case? Mm, because yeah. really, the AI is not what everyone's interested in it's exactly. about the output and the results that that Very type true. of technology can create if it was called you know blue moon i'd be interested in blue moon so it's not about like just because it's artificial intelligence it's about what can this do for me what what's the result that i can create what's the time saving i can have you know with this ai so i i think like if people focus on the use case and the output and the results and a lot of people actually not even put the word AI into their messaging yet, and they actually use AI and have been using it for three or four years. Yeah, um, we've had like AI for you know you'll probably correct me here, but you know fifteen years something like that. I remember when Spotify first came out and we had like suggested playlists and things like that. It was a form of sort of AI in some shape or form. We've had you know, on our Gmail, we've had like suggested prompts, you know, with regards to filling in the rest of our emails for years yeah. now. Wow. So all, all, all of these things have been here for quite a long way, but it just hasn't been you know, marketed in the same way. And obviously, some yeah. of the technology is slightly different, but the underlying sort of use cases have been there for, for quite a while. Yeah, great. Thank you. And, um, you know, if you want to give one piece of uh, advice to tech founders um, you know, who are currently on the pre-seed or funding stage, what uh, it would be? I think the thing would be not to hire in a rush. I think it's okay. a lot easier to build the model and build the engine first, mm -hmm. make sure that that's working, and then layer on the talent on top of that. I think too quickly and too often founders jump out of you know sales and marketing too early and delegate that all you know to, to everyone else really that's not delegate it's really advocate is all, often what mm -hmm. i talk about they kind of just yeah. literally sort of disappear off the earth and, and give it to them and they haven't really worked out how it works what it looks like so my big recommendation is build the engine first then build the mm -hmm. team later Great, great, great. And to for our listeners, you know, how they want to contact you if, if, and, you know, get your advice or expertise, uh, how can they do that? Is that uh, the website or do you have any special page to book the call or something like that? Yes, you can book a call on our website. Uh, and it's one of the main consistent CTAs, so salesforstartups.co.uk is our website. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to connect with me personally, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. I'm unfortunately the only person with my name in the world. So if you type Very in unique. my name, <laughs> you know, you'll find me pretty quickly. So yeah, I look forward to connecting people. And mm -hmm. if you do connect with me on LinkedIn from this um, podcast, you know, just please reference the podcast uh, so I know where you come across me. That'd be great as well. Great. That's great. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, James. By the way, I'll put the, the link uh, to the profile, LinkedIn profile and the website details down in the description below. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you, James, uh, for your all your uh, input. Really appreciate that. Yeah. I really enjoyed it and thank you for having me on. Uh, yeah.
um, look forward to speaking to your listeners soon. All right, then. Thanks, Lord. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.